Hey guys, hey, hey, welcome to Coffee with MB and Beyond. Uh, we've got two amazing speakers with us tonight, but I'm going to hold, ask you guys to hold your horses a little bit longer um, until some of our audience start joining in. Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to be just sharing my screen, getting to know you guys better. I know a lot of you are targeting round two. Um, some of them, some of you are also trying to apply to a bunch of schools as a mix of round one and round two. So we're going to be, of course, mainly focusing on round two discussions today, while also touching upon um, uh, nuances of round one for some of the candidates who are targeting that. Uh, having said that, uh, again, welcome to Coffee with MB and Beyond. It's Paridi here, the co-founder of MB and Beyond, and I love to do this week on week, bringing the insights from the experts and the community to the audience, which is trying to target some of the top business schools. Today, we've got an excellent consultant with us and an admit of MCR and HEC. Uh, we're going to be talking about their intros in a little bit. Before that, um, there's going to be a pressing question. I'm going to flash something on my screen. Just help me understand what do you guys um, think when you're thinking about MBA? Why do you want to put in so much of money into an MBA? And it's a word cloud, so you can really type out. The words are going to pop up. So it's just going to go show. If you're not uh, connected um, on your phone and on your laptop, you could just scan this code and go ahead and start answering. Otherwise, you can go to slider.com and key in the code 2365905. And I'm going to be clicking on showing the results so that we can, okay. Maybe we can start answering. I'm not sure if I'm at the right spot. Just allow me 30 seconds. I'm gonna go back and present it all over again. So it's an expensive investment, right? Like it's a lot of money. Somebody, if somebody give me an option, okay, take 100K, go for an MBA versus, you know, go travel the world or maybe build a business, I would have chosen the other one. So I want to understand why would you go for an MBA, put in that kind of money and then probably it should start showing up here. It usually doesn't work like that. Uh, but if you guys are keying in, go ahead. I'm also going to do the same. Let me just see to test it with you guys. Okay. Are you guys not able to land on the poll? Okay. Yeah. But now we should. Yeah, yeah, now we should. I've just, I've just, uh, I think I didn't start the poll. That's it. Yeah, now it will. So, guys, uh, while you're at it, I'm going to now take a moment to introduce our speakers and, of course, hand over the mic to them so that they can introduce the, themselves to you and you can get to know who you're really getting insights from today. We've got Arthi with us. She's been a consultant with MB and Beyond and has been helping candidates on her own for more than a decade now. She's helped more than 1,000 candidates get into some of the top business schools, including Ivy Leagues, NCR, LBS. Uh, just a moment, she's going to introduce herself as well. And the second speaker is Saloni. She's made it to NCR and HEC. Uh, while, of course, she decided to go to NCR and start her business school journey. She comes from a consumer startup background, and I am sure she has a lot to talk about her background more than what I am talking about. And then we can, of course, bombard her with all the questions that we've got. So let's get to know our speakers better. Arti, why don't you go first? Hi, thank you so much, Paridi. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having us and attending this session. Um, like Paridi said, I've been in the international education space actually around two decades, 18 years. This is my 18th year. And my speciality has always been Ivy League schools and uh, with mainly the MBA program. And yeah, I've been doing this globally. My clients have also been all over the world. Uh, last year, I had a really good chunk of kids get into Booth, Stanford, Kellogg, 
LBS in SIAD, all with scholarships. Uh, so yeah, I'm just looking forward to talking to everybody today. Thank you. Yeah, so that like brings up a top M7 names on top of our minds and I'm sure that rings a bell for a lot of our audience. Thanks, Arti, for joining us today. We're really looking for an insightful session with you. Why don't you Thank go you. ahead, Saloni? We're really excited to hear about your journey. Where are you at, industry? And what drove you to especially go for an MBA? We're going to come to that in a bit. Go ahead. Thanks, Parili. Um, really excited to be here. Just pardon my throat a little bit. It started to act up two days ago. I was hoping to be better by now. <clears throat> you have coffee really? or tea with you while you're Yeah, yeah a lot of warm water. Oh, yeah, I'm all coffeeed out. For sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> So yeah, like uh, Paridhi mentioned, I have a consumer internet background. Um, in fact, uh, I started my career in wealth management, um, did that for about three years, worked exclusively with the ultra high net worth individuals and uh, corporations, managing their money. Um, then sort of got, I think, plateaued there, I would say, and then wanted to explore the startup space, so moved into um, uh, one of the largest consumer internet uh, startups to come out of India called Ola and uh, did the, that for about three years. I basically did a bunch of things there. I built, uh, I grew businesses, I built alliances, I launched markets, I designed products, I built teams and so on. <clears throat> and uh, for the past couple of years, I've been uh, continuing the startups ecosystem, consulting with the multiple startups and helping them figure out their growth journeys, their product journeys, their consumer journeys. Um, so that's largely where I'm at. And um, yeah, like I worked with MBA and beyond. Um, so I, of course, why MBA short? Uh, we Maybe we can give that a little bit more time later on, but largely I think my view uh, was and continues to be a little bit long term. Um, I'm also an older candidate, so I was looking at only European schools. And uh, I feel that careers today are not just 10, 15 odd years. Uh, they are careers are more 40, 45 year uh, spans. And uh, having, I think, a good brand on your profile plus the network advantages that that offers in the long run, I'm hoping that pays off, um, even if immediately it may not necessarily seem like the most obvious move. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Saloni, yes. for a great introduction. And I'm sure we'll build upon more about your profile uh, as we go through the session. So guys, how the session is going to look like the first 30 minutes, we're going to open up, warm up to the most pressing questions that you all have, which have been sent out to us. We're going to touch upon that them uh, while the next 30 minutes are all yours because we want to make it a very interactive session. So next 30 to 35, 20 to 25 minutes, we're going to be talking, warming up and the remaining 30, 35 minutes are all yours. So you can prep your questions. If you have questions that are coming through to you as we are talking, feel free to drop them in the chat window uh, on the side while you can also raise your hands and we're happy to introduce, get you to introduce yourself and ask your questions while the session is going on. So feel free to go on the mic, unmute yourself and also go on the video if you really want to make it a very interactive Q&A sort of a thing. Completely up to you in your own comfort space, whatever calls out to you. Uh, while I can see that why most people want to go for an MBA, it's um, okay, money and career and advancement. We are looking for more people to answer here. I can see 28 of us. I hope we can get to see a couple of more answers uh, coming in uh, in the next few minutes. We can start with the first question that, have come, that has come through to us, um, which is a classic dilemma between round one and round two. So question to our speakers today, Saloni, Arti, uh, do you guys think there is a stark difference between acceptance rates of round one and round two? Um, if not, then which round do you recommend candidates to apply in? Anyone can- I'm here on you. Arti. And I'll completely let you take that Hi. one. Sorry. Um, <laughs> You know, I was just doing some uh, stats research with my colleagues uh, and we were having a hearty laugh 
uh, and it will come as quite a shock to most of you that in 2022, most schools, apart from in Seattle, actually had a slight higher acceptance rate in R2. Oh. Now, do not, yes, it's true. Do not get very excited. I can explain some of the reasons to you so that you can uh, balance your excitement out a little bit. Um, I think A, because R2 guys have a lot more time to work on their apps. Additionally, people, uh, when schools start to decide uh, the admits from R1, uh, let's say, uh, which usually have a higher quality of candidates applying in early in R1, they get accepted to two to three schools, but obviously they accept only one school. So the other two schools are then racing to fill the rest of their seats. So it kind of balances out that they will want to have more people in uh, R2 because they also have a specific number that they're trying to fill out. However, uh, and this is something actually really interesting Paridi said uh, earlier uh, uh, when, I, when I was on another chat with her, she said, it's better to apply your application in R200% than 95% in R1. And I think it's just stuck with me. It's really wonderful advice to any student. Um, always apply when you're ready. What is the point uh, otherwise? Uh, so that that's kind of my short, sweet take on it. Thanks, Arti. Saloni, your thoughts and which round did you go for? Uh, curious to find out. Yeah. I was R2 in CR. Yeah. <laughs> and what about I H figured. <laughs> and what about HEC? I figured. <laughs> HEC, HEC has a monthly rolling intake. Uh, but I was, uh, I would say, like at the in the first half of it. Got um, it. Okay. So I think early enough. Um, but uh, I actually want to double down uh, on a point that you mentioned, Arti, and uh, you also, you know, attributed to you, Paridi, is that um, apply when you feel you're ready and when you feel you have the best application, for sure. Um, I think, as you also mentioned, Arti, that, you know, statistically, it's just one year that you're seeing slightly better acceptances in R2. Those are not really odds that you want to bank on, honestly. Absolutely. Um, right? And uh, I think if you have a strong enough application by round one, go for it. Round one, always the best uh, from what I understand. And obviously the people on the call are experts on this. I'm not. Um, but yeah, like there's no harm. So for me, actually, I was targeting round one. Um, but I couldn't make it. Um, and I felt that uh, it was a conscious decision that uh, between my counselor and I, we took that, hey, you know, we are definitely not ready and there is absolutely no point in wasting an application um, by just rushing through it. Uh, right. So, yeah, I think, and honestly, like, fairly glad that uh, I went that route. So, and um, like, I would also want to sort of maybe touch upon because of the audience on this call uh, that there is a thing where, uh, and Arti, maybe you can um, validate that also, that uh, there's a thing for Indians, right? Where you don't want to wait too long and don't want to wait for later on, later applications. Um, but yeah, I think with that, if there are multiple rounds, then between R1 and R2, uh, the ratios are fairly in your favor as Indians as well. Like even if I look at my peer group uh, at NCR, at HEC, and I know some people at LPS as well, um, R1s, R2s, even Kellogg and uh, a couple of people at Stanford, like R2 Indian regular folks, not with very hi-fi or very different sort of profiles, but genuinely good folks, um, they did make it. So yeah, like apply when you're confident, apply when you're ready. Absolutely. And yeah. completely agree with what both of you said. And again, uh, R1, R2, even if you belong to a competitive pool, a very competitive pool, choose the round where you're most prepared, you're most ready. And there will come a point where you might be rushing through a few applications in round one, which happened to Saloni. Happens to a lot of candidates, by the way, because what happens for us, we're only humans, right? By the time we think we are ready, to start, we are a little late for R1, <laughs> if you want to. And that's what happens with most candidates. So, I mean, the best would be if you could hedge your bet across two rounds, a couple of geographies, a couple of, you know, realistic dreams, like find 
the perfect portfolio of schools for yourself with respect to rounds as well. Like realistic and safe schools can happen for later rounds while the dream schools have to happen in round one and round two. So apply throughout the year, spread them across. Don't try to wrap up everything in one to two months. Give yourself on an average 20 days per application if you can. So if you want to apply to 10 schools, I'd rather if you start eight months prior or seven months prior. But I know that does not happen in a business school world. In an ideal world, people want to apply now. Like right now is the time when we get the maximum rush and we have to say no to a lot of candidates because some of the proactive candidates have already booked consultants for more than you know the schools that you can imagine you're thinking of right now. So instead of being a late to school for round one, I'd rather you be an early riser for round two so that you can submit a very well furnished version of yourself to a business school. Um, there brings like the second question, when should candidates start working for round two? So Saloni, Arti, thoughts? Because we do get that a lot of candidates are struggling with their GMAT, GRE right now. Some of them are reappearing. Some of them haven't appeared for the first time because they know they're going for round two. Some of them are taking it in October. So in an ideal world, when do you recommend they should start working on their application, which is essays, thinking about LORs, thinking about resume? Um, honestly, my answer is yesterday. <laughs> Um, but I know that doesn't happen. Um, and so if I have to be really honest, the, like I said, like my first sentence was, most people about to are to take a lot, have a lot more time. So take advantage of that a lot more time. That is the whole idea of starting as soon as possible. Um, if you want to apply to R2, you're looking at five schools or more for five schools. I think you should start now. So that you can get the 20 days, like Paredi said, even I believe in the three week per school uh, rule. And so that we can give you enough time to do that. Please understand something, guys. I may be your consultant, but I have several other students. Every student's deadline is on the exact same day. I can't <laughs> prioritize you over someone else. I can't prioritize them over you. It's all going to be on a first come first serve basis. So the faster you start working with us, the more time I can give you. And as soon as R1 deadlines and major deadlines are over, which is I like to say mid-September, but it's not truly that date. Um, We'll have a lot more time to start engaging with clients, uh, to start their, what I like to call, you know, I, I, MB and beyond, we like to call content gathering, the exploration phase, which takes a good amount of time to figure out your stories, to figure out, uh, you know, what's going to make you unique, to also have kind of a, uh, you know, story as to why we're looking at R2 and how much we're prepared we want to look like for it. And all of that is a lot of work. So, uh, and given that y'all are writing your GMAT, y'all are working full time and we're constantly messaging you and asking you what's going on. I think it would be really nice if my all all of you please enroll with us and start working with us right now. I'll be very happy with that. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> do not wait regardless of your GMAT status, because the fact is, if you want to go to an M7, you want to go to a top school, you have to get a certain range of a score. Uh, so what I would say is if you get a score lower than that, hey, go back and write it again. So that's never going to change. But in the meantime, we can have more time exploring our journey together. And yeah, so that's that's what I would say, guys. Take advantage of the fact that you have more time and you're doing this in, uh, you know, August. Kudos to you. So I'll just chime into what Arti said. And before maybe Saloni, you could get, give your inputs. Um. So it's like an MBA application is going to be a very introspective process. While, of course, like there, it is out there in the market that once you pay a consultant, it is technically valid and it's not MBA and beyond any consultant you ever want to work with any consulting firms. It's valid for one full year. So my question to my audience always or, you know, to candidates always is if you know you're going to apply this year for whenever the deadline is, whether it's round one, round two, round three, round four, does not matter to me. Why don't you take full advantage of your consultant's time, which is what Arti said, instead of you doing it in a sequence. So the earlier you start, the better it is. And we've clearly seen candidates who start earlier 
uh, in the year when they know they are better prepared. They may be really slow in their journey. They don't have to connect with consultant like every other day and they're not anxious. They're less anxious for sure. They might just connect with their consultant like once in two weeks, but at least they are on the right path. They are at least getting the conversation started. They're starting to introspect about some of the questions that uh, are going to take a toll on you. And one of the question is actually, why should you be putting in so much of money? Because you, the answer to that is why MBA? You cannot tell the school that oh, I want to make more money. You need to position yourself as a global business leader who is going to solve a real world challenge. And just putting that out there is going, is, is going to portray a solid brand of yourself. That's going to take some amount of thinking. You can't just jump onto writing your essays. So as I am walking you through it, there are a bunch of sections you will have to answer, which is goals, strengths, achievements, weaknesses, failures, international exposure, uh, extracurriculars, why MBA, then you have to do your school selection because that happens much later in MBA and beyond school of thought in our journey. You of course first do content gathering and it's actually at step six when you do the school selection. So once you have to know what you are presenting yourself as and what your goals really are, why do you need an MBA? Only then you're going to go on to the next step of picking the schools. Then you're going to allocate schools to your realistic, safe, and dream bucket. Once that has happened, then you jump onto writing your essays. Trust me, once all of this is done, writing essays is like really, it comes as a very easy thing to do. So, I mean, this is how I think. If you are getting an opportunity to work with a mentor for one year, please utilize that full one year. That's how I will put it. And there is no right or wrong time. Some candidates even do profile building with consultants. So they spend like a year just building their profile. Okay, what is the promotion? Should I, I should I change my function? Should I change my industry? Should I do some more extracurricular work? Should I get into more leadership oriented roles? And then when it comes, when time comes to write an application, you just have to put it all together to put the pieces together just to portray yourself as a, again, global business leader who's going to solve a real world problem. And that's what business schools care about. Whatever role you want to put it out there, does not matter. I know half of you want to become management consultants and the other half is confused, while 10% of them probably wants to become product managers. <laughs> so that's what happens. So uh, Saloni, what are your thoughts on uh, when should candidates start working? Because I know you were very close to round one when you can be honestly sharing with candidates. It happens to everyone. So go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Mine was a very, uh, I think, uh, very rocket ship kind of a journey. But um, I think uh, I'll tell you why I feel uh, it still came out, you know, with the results that it did. Is that the introspection uh, that Paridi mentioned Um and the content gathering that Aarti mentioned, that's basically your thought process, right? Nobody else can do it for you. And I was already doing that for throughout. So I, it took me about two and a half or three months to prepare and give the GMAT. Um, I'm sure it would be the similar uh, timeline for you guys, uh, three odd months, uh, three to four months, and even more if you're giving it in multiple attempts. And uh, throughout that time, what I would suggest is that... Um, start at least thinking about why MBAs, uh, you know, watch a couple of YouTube videos, you'll get a good sense of, you know, what are the areas to think about, uh, look at the applications, like most of the top schools uh, have their application questions right on their website. And even if they don't, you just have to create an email ID, like use an email ID to create an account, look at the questions that they are asking. And just think through those in your head while you're, you know, having your dinner or just taking a break or you know uh, taking a shower and whatever like whenever you you have some free time to think with your thoughts or you just want to take a break and sit back um you can think about those things so that when the time comes to put pen to paper uh you already have a fair bit of content in your head um and you already have some sense of you know where you are what sort of stories you want want to tell uh, through your applications and you're not starting from scratch um, and I think that translates to starting maybe a year earlier right um, and absolutely right uh, you know would advocate uh, I think 
finding help if you feel that this is a journey which you would definitely need help on and you are sh- again you know sure about applying in a certain timeline uh, find help as as fast as you can like as soon as possible um, and I, so one more thing i would want to cover is that uh, a couple of people you know in my peer group when i was uh, preparing for the gmat they were not sure of the score that they might get uh, right um and i think again there's a certain estimate that you can still get uh, get uh, while you're preparing right through your mocks and etc so you have a sense of you know what are the what is the category of schools that you can target uh, or whether you need more time and again that will give you some sense of you know which timeline you might be ready to apply for whether it will be next year or next to next year uh, right and accordingly just start working on it like whether if you are able to do it by yourself great but if not work with people um I've, like i found uh, as soon as i started working with mb and beyond even though i like done all that thinking through actually translating that on paper was a tremendous task again um and yeah like uh, pulled quite a few all nighters i must say and would rather have avoided that <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean we see so lonely to be honest like there are different kinds of people um there is another set of candidates and i'd like to talk about them also that's like highly proactive category of candidates who start very early like candidates who started december yeah. last year they knew they were trying to Most but people also would have clarity right ki mujhe 2 saal wale like 3 years on 2 years on 3 years yes. on i have to do this and this is the industry i want to be in this is the role i want to be yes. in this is the country Korean. yes also like they 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 knew it already like back in the day when they were in college they were headstrong they were very prepared they have to go for an international mba so they were constantly thinking that through while there are majority of the candidates they get a revelation at some point in time in their life that oh now they have to go for an mba so they start doing it like in a rush and that's that's the majority i'm talking about guys so saloni i'm in a very curious and arthi i'm curious to find out the kind of candidates that you worked with uh, how often maybe arthi do you meet such candidates who are really proactive like how often and how is their journey different from let's say how saloni to can now most of our candidates take their journeys sure um you know um the clients who are very very clear um they do start very early and they are highly proactive they are very engaged in the process they ask a lot of questions they want to get it absolutely right and uh so i feel like with those clients you have a much more comprehensive and um interactive relationship an equal relationship where you all you know you are participating with them equally and you can tell them give them really critical harsh feedback and they be like you know what you're right let's go back to the drawing board again and their preparation level is extremely uh i would say methodological and you know i kind of look up to them because they have excel sheets and they have schools research and they have everything <laughs> mapping and timelines and the whole thing going and you're like oh wow like i've entered a web of application perfection here like it is excellent but um i and i think that those are the clients that actually have a much more greater chance at getting into early action to round one uh maybe they don't have such a great profile or maybe they are highly competitive as well but they are very confident and very prepared so there's very less you know anxiety very less uh, personal you know stress and counseling required and you know last minute kind of edits and rush and attention and all of those things that you know kind of um we need to maintain that with other clients we need to maintain certain relations with other clients as well so it it becomes very complex i think people who start early people who are highly prepared people who are highly clear will always have a much more advantage than people who do things last minute uh there you know and i'll tell you i have this experience i have clients global clients 
most of my international clients will take this executive decision that I will just apply in round two because I don't have that kind of time. But with Indian clients, I've observed that they always say, no, ma'am, let's do it. We'll do it. We'll do it, ma'am. Two, two clients, two, two, two applications, ma'am. three applications. And they will keep pushing you to the last minute, keep pushing you to the last second, mm-hmm. you know, There'll be like seven minutes to the deadline and they'll be like, ma'am, log in and check my application and you'll be panicking to like a different level. And I don't know how healthy that is for that person and for the consultant. And you know what? That anxiety doesn't go away after you hit send. Because you've done it in such a rushed manner, till the day you get the interview call, you're constantly thinking about it and messaging your consultant. When am I going to hear, ma'am? What do you think, ma'am? Do you think we should have done this? Do you think... So I think take as much as time as possible to work on your app with us even like Parithi is very right even if you interact with us once in a week for 40 minutes it's fine but do some kind of work towards it whether you're preparing for your GMAT I can see your question here about that whether you're really busy with work 40 minutes a, a week or maybe two hours in a week is great time if you're starting early so it's just so everyone can keep their peace of mind and be very like sure that we're going to give this a hundred percent. Absolutely. So yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm just adding on what Saloni also said that the kind of research that she brought to the table with the consultant also adds up a lot. So, and I, I, and I think we can, while we're talking about this, I think I should openly do this revelation that your consultant is not going to, don't rely on your consultant completely to be telling you, hey, this is A, B, C, D. Your consultant is a sounding board. And Arthi used a very interesting connotation there, which is like we're equals. Treat them like one, use their knowledge and their strategic mindset in having gotten candidates into some of the top schools why you also bring your own skills, knowledge, research on the table and empower your consultant also along with him or her empowering you. So it's a two-way street. And how MB and Beyond works, uh, this is also because we've got some of our applicants also sitting here with us while some of you guys want to start working with us. We want to keep it a very honest and transparent um, discussion because we clearly know candidates who are rushing through there in a different state of mind while candidates who have started with us much earlier. Having that understanding, and even if you're putting your best foot forward for round one, do that. While if you're not satisfied and your consultant is not satisfied, because I know some of you are in that boat right now, do not push the submit button. Do not do that. And if you're having, for any of the audience here, having those second thoughts, I'm going to be 100% available. Saloni, you can get her feedback and Arthi's. We'll just give you an honest feedback. Do not click submit button. You will have ample time and the acceptance rates are not starkly different. The objective is to get in. The objective is not to apply in round one. The objective yeah. is make it to the business school, but not Absolutely. the third round. <laughs> In fact, if you give us more time, we'll make your application better than you've shown it to us at that stage. And that is the whole point. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If you're going to submit it out, do I have time to work on it? I'll come up with more creative, innovative ideas that schools are going to find unique and distinguished about you. But if you simply just want to click submit, then that's going to be your like, final call. Yeah. And... Uh... Just highlighting something, uh, MB and Beyond also does not work on a very traditional method of uh, consulting. Your consultant has taken a journey with either us or, you know, have been to a business school. They've landed in a good job scenario, whether it's Bain, McKinsey, BCG, wherever they are or they are working with oil and gas, product managers, co-founders of Silicon Valley. Some of them have had great experience like Arti herself for more than a decade working with clients, applicants. So you have to understand a consultant potentially at MB and Beyond could be a more like a mentor who's taken a journey like yourself and you also respect the consultant's time. They may not be available at your beck and mercy all the time while you should know how do you use your mentor's knowledge the best way potentially possible for you so that you can get an admit because these guys are really smart. Imagine these are the people who work with Fortune 500s. They pitch to Fortune 500s. They pitch Fortune 500s to investors. Um, 
writing an application and landing you to a really nice network is something that they can do really, really well. They have been exposed a lot. They are young while also been empowered by the admissions consulting industry uh, to bring the right knowledge to the table to the candidates who are trying to bring themselves to top business schools. So my question next one would be to Saloni and I'm trying to cut this short so that we can get to the questions that are on the chat there so that we can uh, really start answering your questions, guys. Uh, Saloni, what was your reason to go for an MBA and uh, pick in CR? So I think I've already mentioned a bit of it and that's largely the gist, right? Um, but uh, I'll add on a couple of things. Uh, one was that... Uh, I was looking to gain a little bit more international experience. Uh, sorry. That's okay. Sorry. <clears throat> and uh, also maybe open some international doors. Um, so I had worked uh, quite a bit in the Indian market with Indian teams um, and to some extent with international teams across Australia, at least the in English speaking world uh, Australia and the UK um, and I felt that there's a lot of different perspective to be gained uh, by working outside of India as well uh, right um, I'm not one of those people who has that big NRI dream but I honestly just after growth and I felt that that's one level of growth um, second uh, is again you know I think the kind of people that make it to the top B schools and there too I was fairly clear in my thought process that these are the five top B schools that I want to go to and beyond that if I don't get into any of these then I'm just carrying on with my regular career uh, right not really going to look at an MBA anymore um, so that clarity I had, you know, uh, to get into that sort of conversation pool, because I am honestly, like having made it to a B school and uh, a couple of B schools and having now interacted with people who uh, I'm going to be attending class with, I am a little intimidated by the kind of work that they've done. Uh, and also equally excited at the prospect of getting to learn from them. Uh, right. Um, so, yeah, I think my reasons largely center around growth and long term growth. Um, uh, I'm not sure how that helps a lot, but yeah. Um, well, what do you what do you what do you plan to do after NCR? I know it's going to start in uh, in a couple of months now. Like, well, what what are you thinking? I'm, I mean, plans can change. But right now, what what headspace are you in? Yeah. Um. So I have done a fair bit of strategy work and I want to continue with that. Um, that being said, I am not just looking at being a management, management consultant. Um, in fact, uh, to be very honest, if I'm looking at, uh, you know, strategy consulting, I would rather look at the knowledge track than the consultant track. Okay. Uh, but yeah, um, I think I, in terms of industries, I would want to explore like a couple of industries where Europe is fairly strong, which includes sustainability and uh, energy um, and to some extent, you know, the healthcare supply chain. So yeah, that's sort of, that's largely all the clarity that I have going in. Amazing. That's really good to know. And all the best for your journey while you're here. We will definitely meet. <laughs> and now I think we can jump on to the question. So Nihal, um, is checking in is it wise to fight the GRE or GMAT I think we slightly touched upon it but we can answer <laughs> that more directly is it wise to fight the GRE GMAT exam plus TOEFL and application at the same time it's a lot of tussles essentially what are your thoughts Arati Saloni anybody can go first you won't be able to do justice I'm sorry Arati but like you won't be able to do justice to any of it if you start, uh, you know, if you think that, okay, I'll allocate 33, like one third, one third of my time uh, like this. I, I think it's really important to build a timeline for yourself. Uh, and definitely your scores have to come before the application in any case, right? Um, so yeah, like I would suggest that start thinking about your applications, but maybe don't, not at the expense of your scores. Arti, do you have thoughts? Sure. Um, Nihal, I am pretty certain that you can do the TOEFL without preparing much for it. So let's please get that a little bit out of the way. It's 10 standard English. Uh, write a couple of papers online and then go give the exam. Now let's talk about the GMA, GRE and the apps at the same time. Let me be honest with you. 80% of my clients are still preparing for the exams while they start working with me. 
Uh, and that's because I follow a policy where you work with me, you start with me much earlier and you also meet me just once in a week for an hour where I give you maximum one and a half hours of work to do. That's it in the entire week. So while I keep my pace slow earlier on, I start picking up my pace as and when you become more confident about uh, your GMAT GRE prep. And then when we get closer to the app, we obviously go in full drive. So all are manageable together. It entirely depends on you, your schedule, your personality type, your style of working, how, how proactive your attitude towards everything is and how like how driven are you to do this? You know, if you're highly driven, you will do everything together. Don't worry about it. And I have enough clients who've done it, uh, even to my own surprise. Even, <laughs> even when I trusted that they would do it, they've done a much more fabulous job. So I think you can do it if you really want to. Yeah, uh, um, I'll, I'll top that up uh, what, to what Arti said and also what Saloni said, because there are different kind of candidates. There are candidates who can, and you have to answer that for yourself. Uh, thanks for that heart, Nihal that you can, some candidates can really compartmentalize their time. It's their strength. They can, and we have seen, and I'm amazed at how they can really do it and have so much to learn from them because they can really say, oh, three days a week, I am going to be fully focused on this. While two days, I'm going to be in my creative space, talking to you, brainstorming with you without thinking about A, B, C, which relates to GRE, GMAT, because GRE GMAT is, of course, and it's it's a test. You have to prepare for it in a bookish format. While introspection for an application is a creative journey you take within, you have to answer a lot of questions for yourself. You probably need a sounding board for that, which is your mentor. Now, what Saloni is talking about is also completely honest, something that I accept you may not be able to jump on to working on your essays until you know the schools that you're applying for. While you may be able to discuss, think about what is your position, a brand that you're going to build for a business schools. Okay, there are top 20 business schools. I don't know which one. This is the mock score I have right now. What can I consider thinking? So you start reading upon the schools, start your research, talking to the alums, talking to the students, talking to ad comps, sounding board is there. Prepare for your GMAT GRE. Uh, so there's no right or wrong answer for this. Figure out for yourself. If it is giving you a lot of stress and anxiety, then no, do it in sequence because some people like to do it in sequence. They want to get GMAT out of the way, then pick up applications. So do that. Choose for yourself. All right. Um, we've got second question by Nihal. We'll come back to your questions again after answering a couple of others. Uh, Kuhu is checking in again. How to manage the application process with GMAT prep if we are looking at R2? I think we've answered the same question. Want to start early, but GMAT prep is already taking all the time. So Kuhu, maybe my question would be, what are you getting in your mocks? If there is a certain minimum that you're getting, which you're okay with, then you know that you are seeing yourself going somewhere to a score, but you want to accomplish it in the next one, one and a half month, you can sincerely already start and you can give this time to introspection again while the essays can happen later. Uh, Prashisti is asking, hello, if we happen to choose counseling services with MB and beyond, what are your fees? We can help you happily share everything with you after this session. So thanks for that question, uh, Prash Parish Parishti, sorry, my bad. And we're going to send you an email. Going to Pragya's question, what are the chances of cracking B schools for MBA with two years work experience for colleges like INSEAD, HEC that have a minimum two year uh, criteria with a GMAT score of around 700? Saloni Arti, I like you guys. I like you women to tackle this. Two years of work experience. My question to you, Pragya, I, I actually don't like answering a, a, a question with an answer. I'll ask you a question. Why are you looking at applying now? You know, that's the most important question. Uh, that's my first question. My second question is, what do you think you've accomplished in the past two years that is so significant or impactful that you've already started setting your eyes and wanting to apply to an NCR HEC? Uh, and my third maybe advice would be uh, do a little bit more research about uh, your fellow, you know, 
uh, future hopeful INSEAD HEC classmates uh, because the competitive, the pool is quite competitive. And um, so, you know, even if I have to take a really big step back and explain it to, to like a layman to someone, I always say that an MBA is usually between four to six years of experience because you have spent the past two to three years leading some kind of projects, initiatives and teams. So you've got some kind of leadership uh, skill sets on your belt, which you might be experimenting around with. You might have been successful, but you've been experimenting quintessentially. And the platform of the MBA is to refine those leadership skills in a more funneled way in a, with a global perspective so that you can take on your next real-time managerial position post the MBA. So like a layman, that's how I explain it. So in the past two years, if you feel like you've been already leading some kind of initiatives, tasks, projects, teams successfully, and you have those kind of impactful stories, uh, then sure, uh, we can apply for you. Uh, but I would still say it's extremely uh, aspira super aspirational. Uh, also considering your score, because, and I say this something really funny, which is Indian and Chinese people have a higher IQ average than the rest of the world, and we've ruined it for our own selves. We are extremely good at aptitude tests. And while a Swedish person will get a 640 and still get into NCR, we will get 740 and still be wondering if we're going to get in and that we've done to our own selves. Uh, it's, all, it's because of our excellence. So uh, 700 is also kind of an average score. So I would say wait a couple of years, retake the GMAT if you can, and increase your chances to get into top schools like in Seattle and HEC. I hope that makes sense. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot, Arti. Saluni, do you have any differing thoughts or anything you'd like to add for Pragya? I think broadly the same. Like even with two years of work ex, it again largely depends on what else have you done and what is the quality of that work experience, right? Uh, how different is it and what kind of stories are you able to tell? Um, Actually, I had a follow-up question, Arti. Um, <laughs> say, for example, uh, and there'll be a lot of people in like this boat, I think, uh, where you know they have work experience on the lower end of the spectrum, yeah. um, and potentially the advice would be to work on their uh, applications and apply again. Uh, does it make sense for them to apply anyway? And if they are not successful, to then reapply in a couple of years? That's such an amazing question. <laughs> Can I? Yeah. It's a really, it's not an answer you guys expect and it might discourage you, but let me be very honest with you. Uh, Reapplication is not, a, it's not something universities internationally take lightly. It is not like India. Har sal dete raho iitexam.com. <laughs> so don't have that attitude. And I'll explain to you very statistically why. First, uh, when you reapply next year, you have to answer the most important question. Why are you reapplying? If you've simply got 20 points more in the GMAT and you've got the promotion that you were already due for, it does not impress the school enough. So what have you done in the past nine months of your application that the school should be wowed and admit you? So that's the first reason where most people are not able to really justify this answer. And rightfully so, in nine months, what are you really going to do? Frankly speaking, unless you have a very... Uh, you know, completely off branch, something ex extremely unique that you've accomplished, which is kudos. Number two, if I look at the application pool, and if there's 8,000 kids applying to any school and, at any given year, there's an additional 2,500 kids applying as reapplicants the next year. So in this year, if you were competing against 8,000 kids, next year you're competing against 10,500 kids. How do you feel about that? So your chances have already reduced statistically. And this is the statistic for every school, Baba. Every school has three, three to 5,000 reapplicants every year. So don't have this attitude that they see what will happen, apply, karenge, whatever that might be, because it might work against you guys. So yeah, that's my two cents on reapp. <laughs> thanks. Uh, and so Loni, thanks for asking that question. And thanks for that insight, Aarti. So um, I'd like to share again uh, with Pragya, I think you need to sit down with somebody just to discuss uh, why you think for the questions that Aarti was asking you. So either with somebody who you look up to as a mentor, just sit down with them 
find answers to that. We'd be happy to talk to you. You, we'd be happy to for you to connect with Saloni as well. She's since she's headed to INSEAD, and life has come full circle for us. She's gotten an admit, and now she's a profile expert with MB and Beyond. Um, that's how we run the whole, you know, inclusive capitalistic model of MB and Beyond, giving back to the community. All our applicants get an opportunity to become a profile expert with us, and in a couple of years, a mentor for all the candidates who want to get go to top business schools. So if you need to, when you're ready with a few answers, happy to receive an email from you and connect you with Saloni and we can have a brainstorming session to understand where you're at. Um, let's take up Kuhu's, uh, okay, Kuhu's question we've answered. Let's go back to Neha's next question. Is it important to apply to some schools in round one and then some in round two? Because if you get into schools in round one, you might be required to pay the money to 100% book a spot in the class. So that's a good thing, right? <laughs> but okay, I'll answer that question because we work with a lot of candidates who apply to both round one and round two. Um, so all of them, they do prepare for round one and round two. Once they get an admit in the desired school, they drop their applications and the hard work that they're putting in for round two. And I, in an IJ case, that's what we all should do. Uh, unless there is a school that you're really aspiring to get into, you may want to put an application through for that. That's how I will simplify for you. Uh, where you are okay to let go some of the money that you blocked into, you know, uh, for example, if you're applying to Stanford and if you're applying to INSEAD, like Saloni did. Now, you want to, you're applying to INSEAD in round one, you've gotten an admit and you want to take a shot at Stanford, you do not care about the money that you lose to INSEAD. Then go for it. That's a question again, Nihal, you'll have to answer for yourself. I'm sorry, we are leaving you in a space where unless uh, Saloni Arti, would you give him a better answer which makes him decide? Dude, if you have money to burn, like, yeah, <laughs> you're, you've already won in life. <laughs> somebody, somebody already said so uh, when I asked uh, the, the poll I was running like word cloud why are you putting in so much of money into an MBA and the first sentence was I don't know who did that but I love the answer oh I have too much money <laughs> yeah, so, yeah somebody did write that hilarious just playing the MBA rule eh? yeah I want to talk to you whoever that was uh, probably we could seek some investment from you and I'd rather and I'm assisting <laughs> you I'd grow your money more than a business school would <laughs> Sorry, I mean, I believe in business schools a lot, but yes, you need to know a very, you have, you need to have that conviction to go to a business school for sure. <laughs> uh, going to uh, the next question, Rudranil asks, if I plan to apply for 2026, wow, I love this is super proactive. Intake for INSEAD HEC is right now too early to start. Planning to give my GMAT in Q1 2024. Saloni Arti, your answers to that. Mm. Hi, Rudranil. Uh, really love your proactive attitude. Would really hope you become my client whenever you decide that. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, it's never too early. Uh, it's at least never too early to start doing schools research. Uh, schools research is something you can do year for years, just FYI. I'm 18 years into the business still doing schools research every single day. So absolutely not very early to start. Uh, in fact, I think it'll be a great idea to connect, have a mentor, have a consultant who can give you a lot of uh, career-based advice. How in the next two years strategically you can build a steep career graph this is something that a lot of our clients you know before you realize it you're already plateauing in your career and unless you're someone like a Saloni who will take this bold move and when she's plateauing she moved on to a startup which is excellent most people stick on and work for four or five years <coughs> in that, that kind of a role and keep growing stagnantly so if we if we have access to you and you you choose us to help you with that I think career building is is an excellent option to start off with so that when we present you to schools, A, your consultant already knows your story like it's their own story. And also B, because um, we've helped you and maneuvered and strat strategically placed you in situations, projects, tasks, leadership initiatives that the school will be wowed by. So absolutely not. But yes, ideally, we, if you giving it in Q1 to 2024, you can also come then. That's also a great time to start. So yeah, hope this 
answers your question. Thanks, Arati. So, Rudra and Lab. Yeah. Sorry, can I interrupt you? Uh, some of these people have asked additional two, three questions that I think you've missed. Yeah, we, uh, so yeah I was just sure. going uh, back and forth. So, we are not, uh, you know. Okay, okay, yeah. sure. More meaningful, but we are going to go back to that question. So, Rudranil, absolutely, Rudranil, um, you can start as early as you want to, and you can potentially explore profile building options, working with a mentor, just to what Adi suggested, or you could start thinking about if you're very clear on the schools that you want to apply to, start networking, start talking to the alums, to the students, get to know the schools better, attend their webinars, attend their sessions, create a document for that, and of course, make your own research study sort of a thing, work with a mentor, and then when you're ready, you're ready um, with your score and whatever. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, Arti, do you see a question that I've missed? you want to take that one up? Anyone? Um, I think um, Nihal had asked about what do you, th the second question, which is okay. good idea to apply an art when you're 100% ready for all schools, like doing all the applications of six schools in November and the other six in December, but hitting the submit in Jan. Uh, so are you planning to apply to 12 schools in <laughs> round two? Nihal, can you start yesterday, please, and not think that six school apps are going to happen in 30 days. Uh, hence, you go all in one together at one shot. Um, okay. Okay. I do I what do I think about this as a strategy? I think it's a, <laughs> not such a forethought strategy. You can have a much better foresight to this and start as early as possible. Uh, six schools in a month. Uh, it's extremely tough on you if let's say you've given your gmat and all you're looking at doing is the application you're still not going to be able to do it because like pariti very clear way um you know um very rightly said uh the creative the the introspection the content gathering process is extremely creative so the answers are not going to come to you in the first four or five sessions with your mentor i can okay, if i can be honest i'm on my ninth brainstorming session with my client and now they're coming up with the actual stories that we would like to put together and talk uh, you know write about in with schools and they're a extremely proactive and intelligent client so it does it's a it's a creative process and putting that kind of a tight lid or like a tight schedule around it just seems um not such a good idea to be very honest so my my answer is no <laughs> okay so, Nial, uh, we we will come back to that. So, the, we touch upon the last question and coming back to you. I think the last question more around Pragya's understanding of difference between uh, Jan and September intake. We can touch upon that. Um, so, Pragya, one day we did like a very comprehensive session on NCR. I'll share, I'll get the team to share uh, the link with you where we talked about Jan versus September rounds and everything, average years of experience. While to give you a short answer to this, there is no difference with respect to placements or anything. The only difference is that the Jan session gets two months of a break, which you can utilize for an internship if you want to, or you can just completely take a break. While the uh, the other session, uh, which is the July batch, J batch, it just goes on uh, end to end. Like it just rushes through like 10 months, no break. Unless Saloni, do you have any other stark difference that you've discovered? Surely that's the difference. Uh, there are some differences with respect to the exchange opportunities, but large, and those are also related to you know when you can go, whether you can go in the third period or the fourth period. Um, otherwise, largely the same experience. Yeah. And, and I know you're really looking for Gear to get into NCR with less number of years of experience. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the profiles that made it to NCR with just three years of experience. I've not seen lesser than that in my experience of working with candidates for NCR. They were like the two candidates. One was sponsored by McKinsey, uh, was completely end-to-end -end sponsored. So it was like a, it's a competition that McKinsey puts through when people get an admit, they sponsor them and then uh, you just kind of go there, come back, join McKinsey again. And the second kind of candidate worked with the government of India um in on a very interesting campaign level like politics and social arm and all of that so it was like a very different kind of profile 
uh, when it comes to profile and their reasons for going for an MBA was pretty much backed by by people like McKinsey directors and then the government here. So let's uh, talk more about why do you want to do it and does your profile really call out for that which catches the attention because the average number of years of NCAD is much higher than that. Uh, I would like to just, and we're coming to Nihal uh, because we have one minute. For whatever reason you have to go for an MBA, also understand more than the books and the knowledge that the professors are going to impart you, you're going to learn from your peers. So make sure you're applying to a school where the average school or you're going to a school where the average age is as good as you are a little, a couple of years here and there, not starkly different. Different Because let's say if I'm much younger and I go to school with people, I'm 23, go to school with a 30 year old, it's, it's not going to make sense. Like I'm not going to have an understanding of what I can learn and what I can give. So it's all give and take between peers there. So that's it. Also, honestly, uh, sorry. Yeah. I go, ahead, you. go ahead, Saloni. Go ahead, Saloni. Honestly, I just ask, uh, or rather maybe something that you can answer for yourself also, why NCR with two years of experience? Why not look at US schools? Yeah. <clears throat> Those would, um, I think, have a much younger and more attuned cohort. Yeah, I think, Saloni, uh, Arti, we've given a lot of food for thought for younger candidates here. Somebody thinking about 2026, somebody thinking about applying with two, two and a half years. I think it was like really insightful. Nihal, um, I can stay back to answer your question. Saloni Arthir, uh, um, you. and we'll right. take the last question. Guys. <laughs> After that, we'll wrap up. Uh, Nihal, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey, thanks, Parivi. Uh, so I just wanted to give the context behind the uh, second question because uh, uh, I'm pretty much lead into the brink so, uh, of this fighting ring. So I started early August. Uh, I've got, I mean, I'll be having seven years of work X when I join in the school. Now, because I'm late, I joined MBA and beyond. Now I have done my branding, right? So I've completed all of that state, uh, steps. But my GRE is not set. So I'm taking my first shot at GRE on 28th of August. And then I'm taking a second shot on 28th of September. So I'm going to keep doing that until I get a good score. So that's the plan around it, the GRE. Uh, and I'm in meanwhile, you know, parallelly working on my application process and tag. So that's two front ward that I'm fighting on right now. Okay. And uh, that's where, you know, I was thinking uh, that, all right, maybe my profile is not at a hundred percent, probably because of my score, if that happens. So, and mm -hmm. if that happens, probably what I can do is, you know, think about the safety scores, uh, my M7 targets, whatever they are, you know, get all the LORs and everything set up, uh, work on them parallelly. Uh, in November, you shoot for about four, five or six, and the rest you shoot at uh, December. So I am set by then with a hundred percent. So that's the strategy because because the background has to be clear where I'm starting from. Uh, I'm late in the ring, and there's a lot of circumstances around it, the GRE especially. So uh, you know that's where I was trying to look for a perspective. Uh, I believe I missed the context, which no, is why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, completely yeah. understandable. And I think Nihal, uh, you also got the answer. So I think how you're thinking for me, it's completely okay. And you're able to think it ahead of time and you are willing to reattempt while you're also working on your content gathering. And I I think Saloni and Arthi would also say that's that's the right way to go about it. Like spend more time on introspection and continue on your a lot of candidates actually while reattempting, when they're done with branding, they pause their application journey for a short bit of while, like for a little bit of we like until you get the score that you're trying to get. Uh, too. So while you also continue to polish your answers at content gathering, if you want to connect with your mentor, you connect once a week, talk about it. Okay, I'm stuck with YMB. I'm stuck with what my goal should be. You can go back to those questions and try and answer them, those until you're ready. All right. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. It was a wonderful session. Thanks, Saloni Arti. Super excited and very insightful. I, I hope everybody enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Good luck, guys. Bye. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.